Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum as part of the Cambridge Festival. My name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College, which you can see behind me on a somewhat sunny and less snowy day. We're recording this event for those who can't be with us uh, in person. Now, Jesus College is very ancient. We've seen many changes. We were a 12th century nunnery, a college since 1496. So we've seen civil wars, world wars, pandemics of the past. We've seen many changes in how people live, eat and work. Now, the Intellectual Forum itself is rather more recent. We were set up six years ago to try to get people to think and talk about important issues and to reach outside the boundaries of our own college. We've had some amazing stellar speakers from around the world, from uh, fashion designer Jimmy Chu, the director of NASA's Deep Space X-ray Observatory, Belinda Wilkes, Helen Clark, who used to run New Zealand and the United Nations Development Programme, the Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization, Peter Simpson, who spoke about vaccine equity around the world and much, much more. We've also shown off some of the transformational work that's being done by many of our own academics, whether that's using synthetic biology to come up with a new safe, clean way to dye clothes, to how we can fix the financial system to save us from climate change and other existential risks. And if you want a treat later on or in days to come, have a look at the Jesus College YouTube channel where most of these talks are captured and where this particular talk will be available later on. We always do things with the Cambridge Festival and, and this year we're doing six events as part of it, showcasing some of the really amazing people from the Intellectual Forum and the wider college. And it's covering everything from the very latest in synthetic biology to making me medieval medical charms via sustainable finance, quasi crystals and digital productivity. So we hope that you'll join us for many of those over the coming few days as well. But to start us off, I'm delighted to welcome a really excellent pairing to talk to us about children's nutrition and the corporate and political influences on that. How can we build better, healthier food environments in the UK? So we're going to hear from the Deputy Director of the Intellectual Forum, Dr. Sarah Steele, and as well as helping run the Intellectual Forum, Sarah works in the Institute of Public Health and has published some crucial work in this area, looking at some of the commercial influences on health. And, and I think she's probably annoyed the right people, the ones who deserved the annoying with her work. She's joined by Emir Davies. Emir has experience working in the civil service and UK parliament, but we got to know him as a student here at Jesus College. We did a summer student uh, project on this work. And he, I should say he's speaking in that role, sadly not on behalf of the government or parliament or the prime minister. So they're gonna speak for a while and then take questions. So please put those in the Q&A section on Zoom. And I'm really grateful to the two of you to join us. Sarah, Emir, over to you. Thank you so much, Julian. I'm just going to share our slide deck and get us started for this evening. So as um, Julian has alluded to, we're going to be talking about the corporate and political influences of children's nutrition. Amir and I worked on a project a few years ago now at the start of the pandemic, it feels like so, so long ago, doesn't it, Amir? But it's only been about 18 months, two years. And so we are going to discuss some of that work tonight, but also just give you a little bit of a wider perspective, introducing you to some of the material from the corporate and social determinants of health, looking specifically at children. Now, the reason we're looking at children is because childhood, quite frankly, is key here. Establishing a healthy diet with regular physical exercise, we know sets children up for a healthful life and good well-being. Of course, to do that, to set children up, we need to be able to provide them not only with the energy and nutrient content that they need for growth and development, but also a positive attitude to healthy eating that encourages them to build their health and well-being. We need to make sure that children receive messages about health that focus on their thriving, not stigmatizing them and leading to some more dysfunctional things around diet later in life. 
Amir and I are going to be looking a little bit at different influences on malnutrition. And we just wanted to take a second before we begin to kind of define what we're going to be talking about. Of course, malnutrition, most of us think about in terms of undernutrition. So that's where somebody has a child who's low weight for height or low height for age or low weight for their age. In short, they're not receiving what they need to grow and develop. But there's also micronutrient related malnutrition, which can be where you lack important vitamins and minerals, or for that matter, have micronutrient excess. So that's a, a misbalance in what you're actually eating and receiving. But of course, one thing we hear more and more about is overweight, obesity, and diet related non communicable diseases that flow through life course from childhood through that cause things like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and some cancers that are a contributing factor to those. So what we're going to be talking about tonight and talking about children's nutrition is hitting on the fact that undernourishment and obesity are actually two sides of the same coin. In many places around the world, it's really important just to emphasize that these can coexist. So you often have households in some of the places that we've done research where corporations are really influencing this, where actually you'll see overweight and obese boy children in the same house as malnourished and undernourished girl children who aren't developing properly for their age. And this is because there's a misallocation of calories globally. Quite critically, we most often actually have an excess of calories here in places like the UK and in Europe, where adults and children are getting more than they need amongst many groups. But this isn't always the case. As we know across the pandemic, across the past few years, food poverty is a real problem. And Amir, you'll cover that in a minute a little bit more thoroughly for us. But food poverty isn't just about a lack of calories, as many assume. Often it can result in the overconsumption of cheap, often really calorie dense, nutrient poor foods. And so as a result of the acknowledgement of these issues internationally facing children across those kind of very early foundational years through school age and into the teenage years, as a result, we've acknowledged that to set up the world for a better, more healthful future, we need to address these issues. So under the SDGs, the United Nations across all of its bodies has set us out the goal and countries have committed to ending all forms of malnutrition by 2025, specifically targeting stunting and wasting in children under five and addressing particularly the nutrient needs of adolescent girls, pregnant, lactating women and old people. On the other side of this around obesity and obesogenic environments, we've committed to reduce one third premature mortality from NCDs. And so that includes creating, not just attending to things like mental health and well-being, but also really addressing meaningfully our environments that drive these conditions where we see high levels of diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. And that means as part of that commitment, addressing the food environments that children are in. And that's because in the last 40 years, the number of school-aged children here in the UK and in other places around the world has risen more than tenfold in this country. The negative consequences for children of that can be poorer health across life course. So it could contribute to hypertension, metabolic disorders, cardiovascular disease in later life, all of these sorts of things. But it also impacts on their self-esteem. And we know from studies that it increases the likelihood of children being bullied at school, which unfortunately reverberates in poorer school attendance levels and achievement. It also leads to poorer employment prospects as an adult, sadly. And at the moment, not just is it influencing those children's life course, but it's also impacting on the NHS. So with the NHS spending six billion a year treating obesity related ill health, which is forecast to rise significantly to 10 billion a year by 2050. So this is a significant issue, not just for children and their caregivers, but a whole society issue, it impacts us all. It impacts our ability to access affordable healthcare services for all, and it impacts upon us in the future. Indeed, in the UK, the data show that obesity rates 
deaths have been increasing and troublingly so across this initial period of the pandemic. We currently measure reception in year six children and we've seen an increase of 4.5 percentage points roughly in that period since 2019 to, to the end count date in 2021. Um, that's the highest annual rise since the measurement program actually began. And amongst year six pupils, obesity prevalence is increasing quite substantially. Notably, the proportion of underweight ch children is higher in year six than reception, but that this doesn't actually seem to change much year on year. What is critical, however, is moving away from those program data, which tend to suggest that underweight children are a huge issue. Actually, if we look at malnutrition, about um, two and a half thousand children were admitted to hospital with malnutrition related disorders in the first six months of 2020, doubled the same period in 2019. So there's good reasons to believe that malnutrition, especially those undernourishment conditions we mentioned earlier, are increasing just as much as obesity is. And part of that connects, of course, to the situation we found ourselves in, in the pandemic, and we'll get to those reasons in a moment. But what we wanted to emphasize was that there has been historically, and as you'll see off to the side here, a widespread kind of narrative that this comes down to parents. It's a caregiver issue specifically. So I just wanna be careful. Most often it says parents, and, and they use that language. We prefer caregivers as an acknowledgement of the fact that diverse people are involved in the raising of children. The, the government's language here tends to be parents on websites like the one clipped there. Um, and what we tend to see is that they're blamed along with schools for not choosing or providing healthier options to young people and children. The narrative is that undernutrition is a result of parents making poor choices, buying big screen TVs, buying cigarettes or alcohol, these kinds of things, and not giving their children food. And in the case of obesity, it's about not getting their children moving. It's about a lot of the time the rhetoric says that people are leaving their kids sit in front of devices, these sorts of things. And it's framed as a caregiver driven issue where schools have a role by not um, pushing and helping parents make better choices. Amir, do you want to pick up and explain a little bit more? Great. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. It's great to be here. Um, so, yeah, just sort of compounding on what Sarah said, we have this kind of reoccurring narrative in the media and politics and just in wider society um, that parent choice is kind of the crucial and sort of fulcrum of, of child nutrition. And we need to really consider the wider structural factors at play here. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing today um, in this discussion. Uh, so thanks, Sarah, if we could move to the next slide. Yeah, so these are there's a number of, of factors at play here, talking about wider food systems, ultra processed foods, um, and the kind of corporate and political dimensions at play there, the negative effects of being exposed to marketing, which um, Sarah will come on to later, uh, and, and also the kind of policy solutions, which we're going to touch later on in the talk. Uh, thanks, Sarah. So the, the kind of narrative and picture that Sarah's carved out here really kind of resonates with what we saw over the pandemic. Um, so we saw really unprecedented food insecurity during the pandemic. Uh, and as a kind of marker of that, between March 2020 and April 2021, during that kind of first lockdown, uh, we saw food bank use increase to record levels in the UK. We saw more food banks in this country than branches of McDonald's, or for that matter, branches of Aldi, Lidl or Sainsbury's. Um, so we're facing a real kind of crisis situation here in terms of food poverty and food insecurity. But we also need to think of food poverty and food insecurity in a kind of longer view, because these are clearly problems that predate the pandemic. So, you know, between uh, 2019 and 2020, there are already more than one in 10 children in England who are in food insecure households. So it's really important that we don't slip back into a narrative that this is, um, this is something that's kind of unusual, unprecedented. Although we've seen really high levels of food insecurity during the pandemic, there are also kind of broader structural factors at play, not just those to do with the pandemic. Um, so thanks Sarah, if we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
And as well as looking backwards to food insecurity before the pandemic, we also need to look forwards uh, and to realise that food poverty and poverty in general isn't going away anytime soon. And there are three sort of interlinked factors here. Uh, so firstly, we've had really low economic growth. Um, so the Resolution Foundation in particular has done some really interesting analysis around this. And they've concluded that incomes are, are on course to be lower at the next election, um, if that's in 2024 or 2025, than they were at the last election, which will make this parliament the worst on record for living standards growth. Um, so this is a really challenging environment to tackle food insecurity and food poverty. And it's also really important not to talk about economic growth in kind of homogenizing terms uh, and to recognize that not all forms of economic growth are made equal. So we need to particularly focus on economic growth for those in the lowest uh, income households, not those just in the middle and top bands. Uh, and also to interrogate narratives about job growth. What kind of jobs are being created? Are they low wage jobs in the gig economy? Are they part time jobs? Those are all really important factors for us to consider when we're looking at kind of food poverty, poverty in general. And then secondly, on top of low economic growth and low job creation, we also have rising household costs, which you know will not come as a surprise to anyone. They've been featuring really frequently in the news. Um, you'll notice if you go into the supermarket, you know, the price of bread, milk, pasta, everything is going up. Uh, on top of that, tomorrow we have an energy price cap rise, which will cost the average household £700. And then we're going to have another energy price cap rise again in October. We've had rising costs of petrol and then rising costs of food and drink itself. So these are all placing a really significant burden on, on households at a difficult time as we transition out of the pandemic. Uh, and I'll come on to that um, a bit more shortly. And then just thirdly, we also have really insufficient and poorly targeted state support, um, which again, I'll come on to in a moment. But if we could go to the next slide, Sarah, thanks very much. Yeah, so in just in terms of household costs, I wanted to look at food as a kind of case study quickly, because it's, it's definitely true that there are global inflationary pressures, global economic pressures that we face at the moment. But in a kind of domestic UK um, context, there are also a number of short term and long term policy failures, which are placing increasing burden on households, which is kind of making food more expensive. And these are really issues that we need to address if we're going to address childhood obesity, childhood malnutrition in this country. And so the first kind of policy failure is the hollowing out of human infrastructure. So over the past couple of decades, the UK has become heavily reliant on migrant labour from the European Union. Here we're thinking about migrant labour in terms of HGV drivers, abattoir workers, fruit and veg pickers and general agricultural workers. Um, and we're seeing, for instance, the average age of these workers going up when we look in a domestic setting. So the average age of um, UK national HGB drivers is really getting um, quite old now and we're not seeing that kind of fresh supply of domestic labour into the market. And so when the UK left the EU, um, we were suddenly faced with a quite considerable labour shortage in these industries. And that was, of course, heightened by the pandemic. Um, so I'm sure if you cast your mind back, you remember the sort of pandemic um, problem that we faced as, you know, lots of lots of these people who worked in these industries were having to isolate, which worsened the labour um, crisis. But really the fundamental problem here is that because we became so reliant on EU worker, uh, EU labour, sorry, that we didn't have that resilience in the system. And as a result, what we've been faced with is, you know, a real shortage of labour in these industries. It's becoming harder and more expensive to transport goods because of a shortage of HGV drivers. Uh, we've seen thousands and thousands of pigs called unnecessarily on farms, not for human consumption, but just because um, there's not enough abattoir workers to call them properly for food use. And we've also seen, you know, fruits, countless, you know, instances of fruit and vegetables rotting on farms because there's not enough labour to pick them. Uh, and so we've had this really bizarre situation where whilst food poverty is getting worse, whilst, you know, families are facing a huge uh, problem, we've also seen a huge amount of food waste because of this policy failure to put in place the human infrastructure that we need uh, to get food to supermarkets. And then secondly, this problem is consolidated by a number of short-term policy failures. 
So we've had a real reluctance uh, from governments to put in place the emergency visa schemes for HGV drivers, pig and poultry workers, fruit pickers that were needed. And we've seen this kind of repeating cycle where a problem begins to show. So for instance, we know there's a shortage of HGV drivers, but there's a government reluctance to act. Um, it takes months and months for a new uh, emergency visa scheme to be put in place. And then suddenly we're in crisis mode. Um, and so we can think about this through a number of different lenses. We can think of it as a political strategy, um, uh, a desire for government to look quote unquote tough on immigration. And we can also think of it as a kind of meso level culture or institutional culture from the home office, a kind of institutional reluctance um, to be quote unquote, you know, to, to allow that labor into, into the country. And we've seen that to an extent also with the humanitarian situation in Ukraine a reluctance to uh, put in place the, the visa schemes that are needed. And then there's also quite interestingly, a potential lack of capacity at the center to deal with these food problems. So I've put, you can just see um, a headline there, PM appoints former Tesco boss uh, to help ease supply chain crisis. That looks like a really good move. It looks like the government's on top of things um, until you look at the date from that article, which is October last year, months and months after these supply chain problems in food started to uh, started to show. So, you know, what that really betrays, I think, is that we've seen a real lack of capacity at the center for the government to deal with these problems. And that's something that re really needs to be addressed. And then thirdly, we have this wider inflationary environment, um, which is contributing to higher food and drink prices. So, you know, rising costs of fuel and energy, making it uh, more expensive to produce food and drink. And again, this is a international problem, but there's also domestic policy failures at play. Um, so we've had, you know, incredibly low carbon and gas reserves domestically, uh, which means that we're more vulnerable to international pressures, international food, uh, sorry, fuel price rises. Um, and the crisis over CF fertilizers, which happened last October, is a really good example of that. So around 80% of ammonium nitrate, which we need to cull pigs, uh, pack food and drink, and also for fizzy drinks, uh, came from this one single company, CF Fertilizers, an American company, and suddenly we were plunged into crisis as that company decided to shut down plants in the UK. So there are a number of sort of policy failures here, which have made food and drink more expensive. Thanks, Sarah. And then thirdly, um, as I touched upon earlier, there's this really sort of insufficient and poorly targeted government support for those who are in food poverty and food insecurity. Uh, and that really came to the fore during uh, the Chancellor's mini budget or spring statement that we saw last week, a couple of weeks ago, it feels like longer ago now. Um, but really the, the key point here is that the Chancellor is trying to re reassert himself as a, a tax cutting Chancellor and there's a real reluctance to use universal credit as a channel to help those in food poverty. Um, so for instance, the tax cuts that we've seen from the Chancellor are not gonna help the five and a half million economically inactive households across the UK, many of whom are in food poverty, um, obviously because a tax cut doesn't help uh, if there's no income coming into your house. What they really need is a boost to universal credit. Um, and there's also this really fantastic graph from the Resolution Foundation here, which shows that, you know, even, um, uh, sorry, that because universal credit is means tested on the basis of post-tax income, the actual changes to income tax levels are actually kind of meaning that there's a reduction in universal credit in a lot of cases. So it's having this sort of paradoxical effect where the Chancellor is kind of setting out these measures to help people, but they're actually, in many instances, making them worse off. So there are a number of challenges here that need to be addressed um, at the domestic level. Thanks, Sarah. And so one of the things that's kind of, I'm gonna take forward from your kind of analysis there, Amir, is that the cost price of calories is shifting. Now, one thing that's really relevant here for feeding children is the fact that healthy calories are routinely found to be in studies more expensive than unhealthy calories. And the result of that is that the poorest fifth of UK households have to spend significant amounts of their disposable income on food to meet 
general guidelines on healthful eating, as opposed to just 7% of spending that would be made by the richest households. Amir kind of alluded to the full fuel crisis and how that's impacting on the cost of goods, but I also just want to emphasize that it's also impacting on what parents can actually cook for their children. It's not just about the price of buying the potato that's gone up. It's about the fact that in many of the very poorest households, turning on the hob long enough to cook it is actually not possible. Did I drop out there? Am I back? You're fine, yeah. Good. So if in many households, the actual ability to cook that potato, to get that potato to a plate, to cook other foods for children, root vegetables are one of the primary examples, but there's also whole, whole grains and things like that, that we encourage as a base for other um, fruits, vegetables, etc. Those sorts of things that are unprocessed or minimally processed foods. Um, those things that are often rich with fiber or starches and things that actually are quite filling for children, those things are the things that spend longer on a hob and therefore when you're in fuel poverty are nearly impossible to cook. And so we're seeing increased demands in food banks for quick to reheat microwavable meals, for cold foods, those sorts of things that are very quick to prepare. In fact, I've, I'm sure you've seen one of the directors here of Abbey People in Cambridge was really prominent across the press nationally, actually speaking about how there is a fundamental shift in what people are asking for from food banks because it's so expensive to cook. They've got to be able to either eat it cold or nuke it fast in the microwave. And that has a significant important influence on children's dietary intake. And that's because processed foods and drinks time and time again in every study that we look at have higher levels of added sugars, have higher levels of sodium, and often have substantial other additive ingredients that have been shown to influence health negatively. They also have a cognitive effect on kids. When you have lots of sugar and salt, you become addicted to it. It literally influences children's brains and they start to crave these things. So it's not just the short-term period of parental poverty that's impacted by these eating choices, but a life course influence that is set up by creating children's cognitive response to these kind of products and, and setting them up to have not just what we would say the palates, but actually creating a food process in these child children where those ingredients are hardwired into what they want and what they, they will eat. And what's really important here is that beyond that cost, it's also about availability. It's not just what parents can afford to do at home or not do at home like cook food, but it's also whether they have the time to do it. And if it's actually, if they've got grocery stores in their area. So one thing we know across the UK is that caregivers are often significantly influenced by the availability of grocery stores in their area, the availability of healthful foods and the density of fast food outlets. And I just wanna emphasize that this is really geographically diverse and that the density of food, fast food outlets and ultra processed foods varies by local authority. And we know that there's significant differences across the United Kingdom. And what we can see time and time again in public health studies that look at this is that the density of fast food outlets is in those areas of social deprivation. Those with the highest deprivation scores, those local authorities where there's more deprived people have a greater density of fast food. And it shows that alongside that, the prevalence of overweight and obesity across children and adults rises with deprivation and food and vegetable consumption falls with deprivation. Now, many kind of went that the pandemic was probably a break point, a moment that we could move away from this, right? But actually that didn't really happen. Fast food buying in Great Britain remained relatively stable. What, while footfall in actual restaurants did fall, and we of course had to close them, takeouts didn't and snacking grew. We saw more takeaways, home deliveries, meal kits being bought. The monthly spend in many households went up, not all households, of course, those most deprived were at food banks. But we saw across the, the range, if you think of it this way, of 
food banks asking us for microwavable food and food that families can actually cook. So the very poorest eating poorer quality food. And at the same time, we also see those in the middle who are now time poor, stressed, trying to home educate their children, buying takeouts and home deliveries, also eating more snacks and drinking more alcohol. I can say I can hold up my hands having had my child at home. I definitely drank a little bit more red wine at night trying to survive teaching him things he did not want to learn from mommy. Um, these increases also resulted in more ultra processed foods being consumed by children at home as well. When you're trying to work online and feed your kid lunch, you're much more likely to go for a processed option or something that's quite quick to make. And so what we see here is that working parents, busy caregivers need fast solutions. Proximity therefore matters as well as cost. When you can't afford also though other activities like sports or dance or horse riding that you see in other socioeconomic groups and children want fast food because they think it's desirable and we'll get there in a minute why that happens. Caregivers often hear that and actually think of providing fast food and providing unhealthful food as a way of showing love. It's a way of giving a reward. I, I've said, I said this to Amir at one point, I'm totally guilty of this. When my son gets 10 out of 10 on a spelling test, he'll often request a meal out he knows mommy would never give him otherwise. Because he knows that I don't want to take him to McDonald's. But if he has some major achievement, his first request is to that because I don't give it to him personally regularly. And actually that behavior, while something that I try to hold back on these days and that I'm aware of, is something that most parents and caregivers do. And we know that goes specifically that when you're in a situation of socioeconomic deprivation and poverty, and one of the few ways that you can make your kids, like your kids feel good for a brief period of time, when you're a caregiver who's perhaps, um, somebody who only sees their children part-time. So for example, a parent with um, reduced contact who's the non-residential parent, often it can be a way of showing love to that child when you pick them up and, and that influences. But it also, of course, schools do. And if you're giving burgers, pizzas, nuggets at school, kids are gonna get used to eating that and that's what they'll think that they eat, especially if that's what their friends and teachers are consuming as well. But one big influence that is really reverberating in studies on childhood nutrition at this point is about food advertising. We've talked about this for years. Most of us are used to hearing about what influence TV programming has and why that's necessitated regulation of what can be shown during children's viewing hours, but that's changing and augmenting. I always say to people as a beginning point, how many times have you seen food advertising for broccoli? Uh, Kidfluencers eating broccoli willingly in their YouTube videos. I've got to say, I did a really good sales job on broccoli for my child. I told him that they were the little trees that the dinosaurs ate and he believed that and is now a broccoli addict for life. But how often do you actually see influencers doing that on non-traditional media? How often do you see this happening on those sorts of things? We know that healthy foods are advertised less than 3% of the time that um, unhealthy foods are advertised. And the industry is spending millions daily on marketing, including specifically targeted marketing to children. And they're engaging now in influencer collaborations with big social media star children, like those of us, many of you know Ryan's World, if you've got children. And they're doing toy tie-ins with major children's motion pictures. So those big releases that we see, you, you get a toy tie-in or a book tie-in that goes along with it that comes with those unhealthful foods. Studies show that those advertising things that are going on actually really do have an impact, even on children who've never eaten the product. So in households where kids who've never been given McDonald's, they've never been allowed to have it by their parents, have been exposed to these ads, they exhibit cravings for those foods when interviewed in these settings. Have I frozen? Okay. Um, combined with those price influences we talked about, where it's really cheap to get a meal that's going to make your kids happy, that's something they've seen online, 
this has potentially lifelong consequences. Now, the reason I want to bring up kid fluences is just how prolific they are. Many of us aren't aware of the studies on this. And there was a really good one in Nature that came out in like just in the pandemic kind of zone that was based on some research from 2019. And that looked at the five most watched kid fluences. So those kids three to, to 14, they collectively generated about 48 billion views on social media, billion, not million, billion views. A sample of um, videos about food were taken and just about, uh, sorry, a sample of videos was taken and just about 40% of those featured food and drink. Um, collectively, that sample, which was just a small amount that researchers could actually look at, uh, had about 16 and a half million views. What they found though was not particularly shocking to me, but shocking to many parents, which is that 90% of the advertised products were branded unhealthy items and 3% were healthy unbranded items or about 2% healthy branded items. So like yo play yoga or the like. So what we see here is a disproportionate skew towards unhealthful products with the brand name on it. Things like McDonald's fries. 94% and not, it's about 94 and a half percent to be exact of items on these kids' videos were unhealthy items. And this is relevant because these kids are celebrities. And it's also relevant because it's not made clear when they're being paid. It's not clear to me as an adult when I viewed some of these videos, let alone our children when they're viewing them. And while certain advertising tactics have been banned on conventional television, these haven't been applied to the internet by policymakers. And so often, and I've certainly been guilty of this, of letting your child just sit watching what you think is a safe channel, something like a YouTube kids app or the like, where they're watching some cute, cute kid talk about something that they're really excited about. And what actually you don't realize is it's a deliberate strategy from the industry to influence what your children are eating. And there is things like the Oreo, blindfold cookie tasting. Can you tell the different type of Oreo? Those kind of things are just cropping up left and right. And they influence children's food preferences, what they demand of their parents, and therefore what parents think will make them happy. And so, there's a big issue here about what we need to think about industry behavior here. Certainly as big tech is pushing various monetization strategies around children, big food has leveraged these kind of multi-platform access points to market to kids in the face of a lack of restrictions on these sorts of things that they would otherwise face. So while they couldn't do the same kind of things on TV or on the radio or on front of packaging in some countries, they're using this lack of regulation as an opportunity to monetize and do this kind of work on social channels. And beyond that, they're also creating what we call brand in hand strategies. What these are are apps that wind up on these things um, for children to play with games around food and engage in device-based marketing strategies. So they're things like filters on Snapchats that add fries coming out of your head. They're things like catch the chicken nugget with your mouth on, on these kind of platforms, those sorts of things. And they are often followed up with discount coupons or other things that try to translate that engagement in the social space into direct purchasing behavior. And so there is a significant um, history here of industry capitalizing on these opportunities when there isn't regulation, pushing when there's a proposal for regulation for corporate social responsibility, pushing so that they can self-regulate rather than being regulated to not do that in that space. And there's also industry influence that's flowing beyond those devices into direct partnerships. As kid fluencers get more capacity to do political campaigning, as industry realizes that they create new textbook collaborations, they also just directly fund schools. They fund programs at schools and they fund activities and things. So I'll just give you a really simple case study here in the UK, which is around breakfast clubs and breakfast provision, which is really important for children in food poverty, of course, to get breakfast at school because otherwise they don't have anything to eat before they go into classes and get distracted. One of the things that sits here is a, a very notable celebrity pushed for greater um, access and funding of these. Of course, in the absence of government provision, 
that was picked up by all, like brands like Kellogg's, brands like Arla Foods, and these big prepackaged kind of cereal brands and think and an industry that has a direct influence in getting kids addicted to their products. And often those products are highly processed. Not all, of course, there are some breakfast cereals that are lower in added sugar than others. But I just wanted to emphasize the industry has got itself as the provider of a food and nutrition solution through leveraging those celebrity contacts and through leveraging those kinds of pushes. And so what we see is that we need to be really concerned about what industry is doing and how that has direct impacts on what public policy makers are willing to do. If they're leaving it to industry to donate products to breakfast clubs to alleviate child nutrition issues, where do we wind up? The US gives us a little bit of an insight here of what happens when you let industry lead the way. Um, and there was a model program that was built under a non-government organization that was directly funded by industry, which pushed the model of energy balance. That is that the solution to obesity was largely from encouraging physical activity. One program that you find in industry documents that was heavily pushed was the Take 10 program, which was a classroom-based physical activity program that was integrated into elementary schools. So the equivalent of primary schools which gave 10 minute activity breaks in the academic curriculum. It was pitched as a solution to the childhood obesity crisis, a whole cafeteria program. And it was introduced as a model across the United States through the ELSI network. What we know is the science and public health data don't support that physical activity is the solution. Of course, it's good for children, but it's not gonna solve the obesity crisis. The data just don't support this. And so we turn to have a look at what's happening here in the UK. And so Amir is just gonna quickly step you through our study on the politics of this and what happened during the pandemic. Great, thank you. Yes, so when we're thinking about parent perceptions, child perceptions of food, we're not only thinking about industry um, and the media, we're also thinking about how government policy interacts with perceptions, how perceptions change government policy, how government policy changes perceptions. And so there was a really good opportunity to study this during the first phase of the pandemic, um, because obviously there were quite considerable changes to free school meal policy um, uh, as the pandemic unfolded. So we know that there was a really long history of providing uh, free school meals to certain pupils at some points or pupils um, in the UK. During the first phase of the COVID pandemic, uh, as schools closed, we saw some quite considerable changes to free school meals policy. So we saw, um, obviously, the, there was the children of critical workers, those who uh, were a child of a social worker, those in local authority care, and those with complex um, educational needs were able to uh, go to school, even whilst the school was sort of formally closed to other pupils. Um, and in this context, uh, Sarah and I conducted some research into how parents' perceptions of free school meals for those who were at able to attend school for the, the reasons I just outlined were affected and how that uh, impacted on child's uh, nutritional health. Uh, so so effectively, just to make that clearer, what we looked at was at parents that either sent their children to school during that period and then returned to school afterwards or parents who had the kids at home during lockdown and then returned to school when the lockdown ended. And we asked them about what happened when their kids returned to school. Great, thanks. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Yes. So. Um, we were asking how the pandemic impacted on parents and other uh, care caregivers' perceptions of universal infant free school meal provision. So that's uh, free school meals provided to all children in reception year one and year two, regardless of socioeconomic background or status. And we surveyed just over five, well, almost 600 parents and other caregivers in Cambridge between July and August 2020. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and so what we found is that there was a considerable reduction in the number of parents providing or allowing their children 
to use the universal infant free school meal provision during the pandemic. So really quite a remarkable drop there, almost from 90% before the pandemic to just over half during the first lockdown. And when we kind of interrogated parents' reasons and motivations for doing that, what we actually found, which was quite surprising, is that concerns over um, sort of health and safety, concerns that, you know, they might catch the virus via school foods, actually played quite low, and that concerns or lack of um, positivity surrounding a variety of foods and quality of foods were really at the forefront of parents' concerns and their motivations for switching away from in universal infant free school meals. And we also find quite significantly that around 20% of schools, 21%, um, according to parents, were not providing any lunch during the first lockdown, uh, which kind of ran contrary to the government's commitment that it made that any child attending a school would be able to still receive that lunch provision. And we need to be really careful about the narrative uh, that comes out of this, because we all know that schools and teachers were facing a really, really difficult period um, at that time. And so I think it really speaks to the need for government to provide schools with more resilient uh, structures during emergency situations so that universal infant free school meal provision can continue because it really was the most vulnerable uh, pupils who were attending schools at that period in that in that time and so really this quite considerable number of of children who weren't able to access that provision is really damaging for food security uh, thanks sir and we'd note that one of the things that sort of came out of this as well is that we i followed up and spoke to a number of head teachers about this in a follow-up um, freedom of information request and a follow-up surveys. And what we found was not only was there no lunch during lockdown, a number of schools didn't reinstate the program after lockdown and encourage parents to bring packed lunches. So one of the major influences parents identified on sending their child with lunch to school themselves was either a school direction to do so or the absence of any school meal provision whatsoever. And so as a result, what we identified here was it wasn't what many were purporting, which was that parents are sending their kids with packaged food because they're worried about COVID getting on the product. It was about the fact they were told to do so by schools or their kids just wouldn't eat the provision that had been made up for, which was often bought in or cold provision that replaced usual cafeteria meals. And that parents perceived that as substandard compared to what had been provided before, that it really was unappetizing, repetitive, problematic foods came up time and time again in our results. Where parents sent a packed lunch though, they tended to use different words based on demographic factors. And Amir, you broke that down and did a kind of word cloud out of this. That's right, yes. Yeah. So what we really saw um, from parents reporting was that you know higher income respondents were reporting words like fruit vegetable salads cucumber water yogurt all these kind of healthy terms uh, whereas those in kind of more stretched socioeconomic backgrounds were tending to report um things like treats bar you know terms that we might associate as being less healthy and of course that really um it kind of evidence is this this wider analysis that we've been developing throughout the talk about you know time poor uh, money poor parents really not having the kind of structural agency um, to develop healthy food choices and so we looked at a number of potential solutions Amir you had some policy recommendations and I had some as well came out of this research that's right yeah so I think an incredibly important point to stress is that we shouldn't silo food poverty um, away from wider poverty because at the end of the day food poverty is just poverty it's the inability to afford um, the most basic uh, requirements for life and those who aren't always um, kind of showing food poverty might be squeezing back in other areas so you know people facing a choice between heating and eating just because they're able to eat that that doesn't mean that you know they're able to 
to heat their homes at the same time. So we need a really kind of joined up approach to tackling food poverty, and that means tackling poverty uh, in a wider sense. And in order to do that, we need to use universal credit for its intended purpose. I think it's incredibly frustrating to see the government develop this new approach uh, to the benefit system, this kind of holistic approach to the benefit system, which, you know, in theory should be able to provide a really efficient way of tackling poverty. But then uh, in practice, the, the kind of huge unwillingness to use that, as we've seen, you know, as I was talking about earlier with uh, the budget and the real pivot towards tax cutting instead of benefit raising. And I think we can also be talking about uh, auto enrollment for those eligible for free school meals, because um, it's really quite surprising that this isn't in place already, that someone who would be eligible for free school meals first has to go through the process of applying for that. Uh, and, you know, there are lots of people who just don't know how to do that. They don't know they have to do it. They don't have the time to do it because they might be working in multiple jobs, long hours to make ends meet. And so that's a really kind of simple and effective policy solution that we could be putting in place. Uh, and I think also, you know, expanding free school meal el eligibility to all universal credit receiving households, permanently scrapping the no recourse to public fund disqualification. Those are all also really simple ways uh, that we could be tackling food poverty. And then on top of that, I think what our research shows is the importance of resilience building for emergency scenarios. So, you know, we shouldn't be in a scenario where a child has to eat, you know, a jam sandwich or a butter sandwich at school during a pandemic uh, because the school doesn't have the infrastructure, the manpower um, to provide hot meals. That really should be a priority going forward from government. And it's not just about pandemics, you know, it's about flooding, it's about power losses in schools. That infrastructure really does need to be in place. And kind of picking up on that, one of the things that I sort of have sat with is that universal infant school meals, those free meals for, for kids that we're providing, irrespective of socioeconomic background, are really actually important. We saw those pre-pandemic numbers being in that 90% range where kids were eating in these communal environments together, provision that involved a variety of foods that parents actually showed relatively good confidence in, I think, in that pre-pandemic term. And that really fell down during the pandemic. When we had these school guidances to bring packed lunches, when provision just fell apart and where we really reduced the quality of it in light of changes to kitchen conditions and things like that. And so what we really need to do in this post-pandemic period is get back that trust, get back that quality, get back that that almost universal uptake of this provision. And I believe expand that to other ages, beginning with primary school, ideally, and hopefully going to the secondary level. Because what we know is when you have that universal provision, it increases the uptake amongst those who are socioeconomically deprived because they don't have to apply <laughs> to get the provision. All kids are just given it unless they are opting out or bringing packed lunches or the like. But it's not just about what happens in schools, as we've, as we've mentioned, it's about addressing the wider food environments as well to make sure kids are getting access to good food or whatever their caregivers can manage. And so we need to address what we call food swamps. So those places where there's just a huge amount of bad food, those local authorities I showed earlier with that really high density of fast food, who often are also what we'd call simultaneously sometimes food deserts. That's where they're plying you with really junky bad food but not a, a good grocery store there's no grocery store to buy fresh fruit and vegetables there's no local marketplace there's no access to good healthful food you can't buy easily those products in some of these places and the fact that that occurs in britain is shocking to me so we need to make sure that we're increasing the provision of healthful foods across the UK, including in the most deprived areas, by ensuring that we actually address meaningfully some of the supply chain issues and also some of those commercial factors, and that we're actually engaging in these kinds of planning and addressing these issues and not simply leaving this to industry to do. And partly alongside that, we also need to change attitudes. Because, of course, it's quite profitable in these areas where people are time poor, where the price sensitivity is leading them to buy cheap junk foods, and where kids are getting access to these social media influences 
when they're, they're having those kind of moments on, on screens where kid influencers are pushing this as a way to be happy. We actually need to meaningfully extend regulation, I believe, to the social media space, not just the mainstream media space. And that's going to involve robust leadership, both nationally and ideally with social media internationally, because while we've got this kind of push from the UN to do things like school meals coalitions and to push for universal school meals through the United Nations auspices to make sure every child in the world gets access to healthy food at school, we also need to push to make sure that we have healthier food environments around that. And in the UK, that for me really involves addressing online advertising to children, um, addressing things like the gamification and brand in hand approaches for under 18s, where they get those Snapchat filters and the like, and also making sure that we robustly address meal assistance for preschool age kids who aren't yet in school environments and also in wraparound care provision for busy working parents and address the current reliance on industry sponsorship and donations. I really work at the heart of looking at the commercial determinants of health. Amir, you've been looking more at the public policy aspect of this. And I think where we universally kind of sat here is that we need robust leadership. We can't put this on to caregivers. It's not as simple as parental influence. Really the way forward is to address the multifaceted systemic issues this whole picture of the social determinants of health is including the, frankly, policy, legal and supply chain elements to this if we're going to meaningfully address both malnutrition and the flip side of the coin, obesity. Are there any questions there from the audience? Julian, I'm gonna stop the slides. And do we have any questions about some of our research? So I think th th there's a number of things coming in, but can I perhaps just start with a, a simple one, uh, which has come in. What's the balance between individuals' responsibility for what they eat, which there's clearly some, and society's responsibility? So I'll take that one, Amir. I think the, at the end of the day, parental choice is just so heavily coerced. Caregivers, at the end of the day, if they don't, if they can't afford it, they can't cook it, and they can't actually manage to access that in their local area in a walkable or, or short distance, they're not going to provide it to their child. So if we're seeing this increase of these kind of what we've called food swamps, which you'll sometimes also hear called food deserts because they don't have that healthful food in it, displacing onto those parents' responsibility is just completely unrealistic. I think there is some element of choice factor and influence, but there's so many things that go into coercing what you can do, what you do choose, down to quite literally where the food is on the supermarket shelves, which has involved a huge amount of research on the, the ways that you can neurologically manipulate somebody to buy that prepackaged fruit wrap thing for your kid instead of the apple by placing things by the, the checkouts and all of those kind of things. Uh, end of end of row packaging and those multi-buy deals these influence so much what caregivers give their kids it's not saying those parents can't make a choice sometimes they absolutely can't because they're getting it from a food bank and they're handed a package let's be clear I'm not talking about those instances where you're handed a box and that's all you can feed your kid but where people are able to go to grocery stores and shop in their area there's just so much neurological influence. There's so much influence from social media. There's so much influence there. Your choice isn't a true choice. Amir, did you want to? Yeah, no, I think it's a really important argument that in social science, when we're looking at politics, there's always this tension between structure and agency, but we need to realize that agency is influenced by structure that, you know, it, it really comes back to what Sarah was saying about advertising earlier. I think that really plays in um to this to this point that um you know that we can talk all day about choice uh but that at the end of the day there are so many factors political supply chain advertising at play um that there's really a lot to be done before before we start kind of moralizing about people's um buying habits i think you're on mute Julian. <laughs> And I was doing so well. I'm going to squeeze in just a couple of questions if I if I can keep you guys a little bit longer. 
Um, so the first one you mentioned at some point um, about exercise. Um, and so, so the question is, you say that exercise is being pushed by the, the, the sugar, the food companies as the answer. Isn't exercise a good thing in itself? So absolutely exercise is good for you, right? Like it has impacts on your well-being. It has impacts on a whole plethora of different things around your body. Absolutely. We're not saying exercise is not part of the picture. In fact, up front we said quite clearly it's a, it's a slice of it, but it's not going to cure childhood obesity. At the end of the day, physical activity doesn't burn enough calories off, especially in the school environment. And especially when we're talking about 10 minutes in school, you're not gonna burn in 10 minutes anywhere near what you're going to take in from a poor, um, say for example, fries or chicken nuggets or things like that. There's just, it's not as simple as calories in and calories out, of course, Julian, you'll remember when we had Giles Yeo come and talk to us in the Intellectual Forum, but there is a simple formula that is underpinning children and whether the fact is if 10 minutes would ever do it to overcome a poor food environment. And the answer is heck no. And so that focus on global energy balance, it's a really neat trick to alleviate industry's role in creating unhealthy societies but it's certainly not the forerunning solution to address childhood obesity. And also importantly, to address the malnourishment and those malnutrition, where we were talking about those micronutrient imbalances that come from an over-reliance on certain kinds of foods, where you aren't having a helpful, robust array of different foods, fruits and vegetables, grains, wholesome things, where you relied on packaging things, that doesn't address that. 10 minutes of physical activity in a classroom is not going to cure those micronutrient problems. I think there's also a really interesting public policy dimension here about, you know, access to green space, access to an environment where you can exercise. Uh, and there's some really kind of interesting, interesting pilots going on at the moment where like local authorities offering free gym access to, um, to people in local areas. So although, you know, I think Sarah is completely correct that we can't cure obesity with exercise alone. I think that it is nonetheless a really important dimension to consider uh, when we're looking at kind of um, happier people, happier lives. And there's all sorts that can be done in that, in that respect. But I would just say Cambridge, like we're talking here in Cambridge, it's part of the Cambridge Festival. One of the core things that I always pick up on, and it's a thing that comes up for me every weekend, I take my son, to Abbey, to the sports area there. And you drive out and what do you drive out of the green space to? The thing that's on the roundabout is the McDonald's, the Papa John's, the fish and chip shop. There's not a grocery store there. You drive straight out into Abbey, which is full of unhealthful food, quite frankly. And it's also one of the areas of Cambridge with some of the highest levels of socioeconomic um, difficulties. It's reliance on food banks has gone up massively across the pandemic. It's a situation where you drive out of a healthy green space straight in with your kids. They come out as Sunday, Saturday or Sunday sports straight past a McDonald's. And if they've been watching, unfortunately, in my case, Ryan's World during the week, it's about mummy, mummy, I've just played sport. Can I have a happy meal? And it takes a really strong parent who has access or a caregiver who has access to other options to say no you go wait till we get home we're not going through the takeout thing now we're not going into that restaurant and the other thing that I would just say is if you're a busy parent if for example you might have this Sunday afternoon a wonderful intellectual forum event on um, charms it's going to be really tough for me to drive out of that same sporting environment, pass the McDonald's and, and then cook and prepare food and then work in the afternoon. And those kind of situations do play on caregivers. So I just wanna emphasize the environment, our socioeconomic conditions, the actual structures of our areas and the plethora of unhealthy food that is just so readily available at a price point that's so much more affordable quickly just does really influence parents. So there's a number of threads that we, we could go down. There's, there's things here about um, what people should say to their schools. But I just want to finish with one policy related question. Um, you'll know that um, there's been work by Dolly Tayas also at Jesus College looking at obesity policy and things. One very, very simple question that's come in online. 
has the sugar tax failed? I think it's a really interesting question and there's a lot of conflicting evidence out there about whether the sugar tax has lowered um, sugar consumption in the public, whether it's had no difference, whether it's actually sort of paradoxically increased it. Um, and I think that it's easy to get drawn into a kind of argument here, but I think the fundamental point that we must uh, consider is that we need, you know, it's that no one is eating poor quality foods um, that makes you feel bad, that kind of has this kind of this negative effect on self-esteem in lots of cases, according to research, because they want to. And that if we have a stick, we also must have a carrot, like quite literally a carrot. Um, when we're thinking about this, we need to not only, you know, tax those who are eat, um, from socioeconomically, you know, um, stretched backgrounds, who are, you know, um, tending to buy this food without also having wider support mechanisms in place for them to purchase the more expensive, more time consuming foods. And as we face this cost of living crisis, you know, I really don't think that the best public policy solution is a tax. I think it is, you know, as, as we've touched on, to give people the agency to make better decisions um, via, you know, whether that's an uptake in universal credit, whether it's um, subsidising cheap, um, sorry, healthier food. So there's there's lots of better ways out there to do this, I think. And I would just say that the sugar tax ultimately has been on sugar sweetened beverages. So it's been on a very limited cut of things overwhelmingly. Like we're not talking about a tax on all things, all sugars, obviously. We're talking about a very narrow band of things. And what we also know is that industry has used that environment of taxation to thwart it and work around those policies by doing things like doing buy one, get one free offers or buy one, get one half off which if the taxation is an uptick in the overall cost of the goods, then when you get buy one, get one free, the tax doesn't matter as much, right? Because you've got an incentive. There's a psychological element to it that people think they're getting a bargain, so are more likely to buy it. But also there's an element to it where the tax didn't really just work there. Um, so there is a, a critical element to say that one, a lot of the research in public health is not saying that sugar taxes don't actually impact on consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. Actually, we do see a fall in it, but the greatest fall would be achieved by other more robust policy options, like, for example, also prohibiting buy one, get one free offers and those kind of things that are used by industry as a tactic to get around public policy. Just let me very quickly squeeze in one final question, then I will let you, you go and enjoy the remain, remains of your evening. Um, so, so Jazz says, is it time for nutrition to be included in the national curriculum? Short answers, please. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the government has taken some steps, I think, or it's at least made some commitments to, um, you know, increasing, um, you know, education of nutrition in, in schools. And I think, you know, I think that is important, but you know, again, it's it must be part of a holistic approach. And if we're not cracking down on these influences, if we're not, you know, giving people the agency, then it really, you know, it's really not going to amount to, to much at all. So I, I think it can, there's a risk that it's used by government as a kind of smokescreen, that it becomes a kind of central policy and a kind of flag waving uh, when really, you know, it's not the most effective thing to do. I think it's really important to educate kids about food environments, right? Like if you engage kids, if you get young children out gardening and allotment on the school grounds, if you get them to engage with food production, they learn science, they learn geography, they learn all manner of things through that. And they learn about nutrition as part of that holistic engagement with food production, food environments. They understand where things actually come from. They understand what they should look like. They understand they can be ugly, right? Like how many kids actually know what a fruit or vegetable looks like as an ugly fruit or vegetable and that it tastes good and it tastes really good. Um, especially, I love picking raspberries when they don't look quite as pristine as the raspberries that you'd buy in Sainsbury's for my son. Like there is a joy to that and, and experiencing it. So I think there is a holistic place for schools to do that. What I'm also super aware of is that there is an element here of the policy with schools and the way the curriculum 
could and should evolve, in my opinion, is to also involve digital and information literacy at a very young age. Because if we start talking to kids about ads on those influencer channels and talk to them about how they are influenced, talk to them about how data works and how those things that crop up on the end of YouTube channels actually get to be there, they'll learn about algorithms, they'll learn about bias, they'll learn all these important conceptual things across their school age curriculum from, from early primary all the way through to high school students. And we hopefully will have a society of more data informed individuals who are more able to appraise evidence and look at influence and understand bias and spot it when they see it and call it out and demand better regulation themselves as adults. This is a huge amount of this can be wrapped up in a holistic curriculum. So I'm really, I don't quite know how to take the question if it was just, should there be nutrition centered specific classes or should this be part of a holistic educational environment? Absolutely the latter for me. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. So thank you very much, uh, Emir, and thank you, Sarah. We have a number of events. So tomorrow we're gonna to be looking at breaking the rules of protein synthesis in living systems. On Sunday, we'll be making our own medieval medical charms. Then next Thursday, it's financing the transition to a sustainable economy, imaging in four dimensions on the Friday. And then we finish next Sunday, looking at productivity. Does it really matter? Thank you very much. Have a very good evening.